Welcome everybody. This is Mary Marinowski. I'm a medical affairs manager with Nestle Health Science and I'll be moderating today's presentation uh, from Dr. Martin Rosenthal, which is entitled uh, Nutritional Management for Surgical and Trauma ICU Patients, Chronic Critical Illness and Sepsis. Financial support, as you can see, was provided by Nestle Health Science. Um, the views that are expressed are those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent Nestle's views. The material is accurate as of the date it was presented and is for educational purposes only, not intended as a substitute for medical advice. So I'm very pleased to present to you today's speaker, Dr. Martin Rosenthal. He is an assistant professor of surgery, Division of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at the University of Florida, UF, College of Medicine. He earned his medical degree from Mercer University School of Medicine in Savannah, Georgia, and did a general surgery residency and fellowship in critical care medicine at UF. His postgraduate surgical training also included nutrition fellowships at University of Louisville and Oregon Health and Science University, as well as an abdominal wall reconstruction course. Recently, Dr. Rosenthal has been building an abdominal wall reconstruction and intestinal failure clinic at UF Health and serves as the chair of the nutrition committee at UF. Dr. Rosenthal is a member of several professional and medical organizations that you'll recognize, such as ASPEN, SCCM, and is also a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. He's written numerous journal articles and textbook chapters, and we're thrilled he's gonna be able to share some of that research with you today particularly in relationship to persistent inflammation, immunosuppression, catabolic syndrome, or PICS. So welcome, Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, it's an honor being here, and thank you uh, to Nestle for, for having me. Uh, we're gonna get it started with uh, some of our objectives today, and um, we're gonna identify immunomodulating nutrients and the rationale for use in surgical and trauma patients. We're gonna actually discuss the evidence of arginine immunomodulation uh, formulas as it relates to tolerance and clinical outcomes, some of the rationales uh, for the use of arginine containing formulas in septic surgical ICU patients, and then I'm going to discuss a little bit about my uh, research on chronic critical illness. Here is uh, the uh, evidence-based blend of immunonutrients. Most of our immunomodulatory formulas have arginine omega-3 fatty acids and nucleotides. You can see that there's over 15 randomized control trials with isonitrogenous isochloric controls. And these are what is driving immunonutrition uh, products today. I'm gonna to start out with some of the elements, uh, all three of the major elements in immunonutrition. And arginine uh, is one of the ones that uh, I certainly like a lot in the sense that uh, from a surgical standpoint, uh, you could see that it's largely required for wound healing. Uh, it's a conditional essential amino acid and what ends up happening is during uh, certain severe stress states, such as sepsis, polytrauma, burn, necrotizing pancreatitis, some of the pathologies that land our patients in surgical ICU, uh, this uh, amino acid becomes deficient. It's required for our immune response and both the innate and adaptive immune response. And like I said, when you have these patients that are having huge wound burden, uh, you know, necrotizing soft tissue infection, somebody that's got a decubitus ulcer, uh, arginine comes in because we need it uh, as a critical component of the collagen matrix. And then getting to anabolism is something that I am trying to uh, figure out as far as going from the chronic critical illness state back to homeostasis. If we don't get these patients anabolic, it's going to be certainly hard to get them back to a recovery. And as you can see, arginine uh, is synergistic with leucine in the mTOR pathway. And mTOR stands for million targeted rapamycin. Here you can see that arginine uh, will either go down two different pathways as it goes either into the nitric oxide uh, pathway. Uh, and nitric oxide, as most of you know, uh, is a good vasodilatory element and actually helps support oxygenation for these uh, wounds as well as the uh, tissue bed helps to raise the oxygen tension in the microvascular uh, system so that these wounds actually do get uh, high concentrations of oxygen delivered to the healing process. Or it could go down uh, and turn from arginine into ornithine uh, in the ornithine citrulline cycle and uh, 
get shunted off into the uh, collagen matrix to again support our wound. And right down the middle, you can see that arginine at the end of the day is going to be essential for our T cells, uh, not only for function, but also proliferation. So, where does the deficiency actually come from? You know, arginase 1 uh, induction happens during the stress state. Uh, we have decreased endogenous arginine synthesis, and certainly we have decreased exogenous delivery. When we have a septic patient or patients who are impressors for various reasons, uh, they may not get enteral nutrients. They may be NPO. They may have uh, bowel discontinuity if you're going for surgical sepsis. You may have a polytrauma patient with uh, requiring a bowel resection that needs a second look operation. Uh, and certainly if you use different formulas, you may have a arginine depletion or an arginine deplete state very quickly. And as you can see down at the bottom of this slide, arginine depletion increases risk of infection, increases risk of inadequate oxygenation, microperfusion, but also causes uh, cessation of T cell proliferation as we saw on the first slide or the slide before this. And if you look at where the zeta chain is on the T cell receptor, the zeta chain requires arginine to be functional. And if you have arginine depletion, your zeta chain or T cell receptor uh, can actually be dysfunctional. And this leads to energy or recall, as you remember, to uh, antigens. And this decreases immunologic memory. The second uh, uh, component of our immune nutrient that I'm going to discuss is omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids, predominantly EPA and DHA from our fish oil, uh, have largely been positive in the sense of decreasing the inflammatory response. Omega-3 fatty acids uh, is what is spearheading some of the research going on right now because uh, oftentimes the patients that receive omega-3 fatty acids have a favorable clinical path, they have uh, favorable outcomes, and they certainly have decreased inflammatory biomarkers when you look across major GI surgery. Uh, they have a high prevalence of omega-3 fatty acid deficiency in the U.S., so it makes sense to supplement the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids to decrease this uh, deficiency. And this actually comes in uh, context when we start using immunonutrition in our ERAS protocols or our enhanced recovery uh, after surgery. And so if we can get these deficiencies replete before we actually do an elective operation, it makes sense that we'll have better outcomes. When you have omega-3 fatty acids, there's a lipid byproduct of the uh, EPA and DHA, and these are gonna be our pro-resolving lipid mediators. Dr. Charles Surhan in the corner there uh, discovered these molecules because initially he thought that uh, there's got to be a yin and a yang to the inflammatory response. Historically, we used to think that uh, inflammation just petered out. It either got diluted out, the signal was lost, you got source control, and eventually the inflammatory response or surge response just petered out. Well, we now know that there's an actual pro-resolving or an active component to that, and that's what he coined as the specialized pro-resolving mediators. It's not, a, uh, it's not a brand new concept because you can see back in 84, lipoxins were studied. Uh, uh, aspirin stimulation of lipoxins actually cleaves uh, DHA and EPA to produce higher concentrations of some of the specialized pro-resolving mediators. And then we started coming up with animal models starting in 2000. And these SPMs decrease uh, inflammatory response through mechanisms that are endogenous to our, our bodies. Cessation of leukocyte, uh, leukocytic infiltration they don't come out of the uh, blood vessels as readily. Uh, they counter-regulate uh, pro-inflammatory uh, mediators and cytokines. They stimulate the uh, uptake of apoptic neutrophils, and they clear cellular debris and even bacteria. These omega-3 uh, resolvins have been characterized, and Dr. Surhan was quoted as saying that the resolution of inflammation is now held to be an active process. Like I was saying, it's no longer just petering out or getting diluted out as we once thought. We reported that the endogenous omega-3 DPA is converted during inflammation resolution to a novel uh, omega-3 fatty acid byproduct, and these specialized pro-resolving mediators are now uh, broken down into three species. They're uh, resolvins, protectins, and marisins, and those are all going to be used to uh, help restore the inflammatory process to get it back to homeostasis and uh, hopefully increase clinical outcomes. It's an interesting molecule because they only need nano and picomolars to actually be bioactive. So stay tuned. I do think that this is coming along uh, very nicely, especially with our omega-3 fatty acids.
the role of nucleotides, you know, they're the building block of DNA and RNA. And I had to go back to med school to figure out uh, all this stuff again. Uh, it's been a while, but as I recall it, uh, adenine and thymine form covalent bonds. There's two bonds that go together to form uh, DNA along with guanine and cysteine that have three covalent bonds. And once you move down to the RNA cycle, adenine actually will use uracil on the replacement of thymine, but these are the building blocks and are largely indispensable in a stress state because there's this de novo production or salvage production. And if we're supplementing these nucleotides, we might be able to help our stress cells to, uh, to generate DNA and RNA to make proteins that are gonna ultimately uh, allow us to have better clinical outcomes. Uh, they're essential for rapidly replicating cells, certainly lymphocytes and enterocytes, to help support the immune function, both in the bone marrow and in the uh, intestine, the uh, gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And again, you know, when you have a patient who uh, potentially has uh, disuse uh, bowel, certainly as somebody who is in bowel discontinuity and then just gets restored, uh, the disuse function isn't quite there. But if you have a fistula patient who comes in with sepsis, and you have to restore the uh, the continuity, the GI tract, the disuse associated at the hind side of that fistula, the enterocytes and the colonocytes could actually benefit from some of this immunomodulation. So what about the guidelines? Uh, based on expert consensus, we suggest using a standard polymeric formula. This is E1. A large portion of you guys are going to already know this. And so when we're initiating our enteral nutrition in the ICU setting, Aspen SCCM guidelines suggested avoiding the routine use of all specialty formulas in critically ill patients in a MICU and disease-specific formulas in the SICU, with the one exception of O3, which we'll discuss on the next slide. So the immunomodulating formulas contain arginine and fish oil, as we're discussing, are suggested for routine use in post-opera patients, especially the ones that are going to go to the surgical ICU. The substantiation for this guideline was that arginine depletion following the stress of major surgery causes immune suppression. That is a well-known uh, fact, uh, and it's not disputed, and that arginine, again, if we're gonna be helping our T cells, the, the T cell lymphocytes, uh, resurrect their T cell receptors, giving them back their zeta chain, arginine makes sense in supplementing uh, these patients. Formulas containing supplemental arginine and omega-3 fatty acids appear to overcome the regulatory effect of myelite suppressor cells, which we'll touch on in a little bit. These MDSCs, secrete inordinate amounts of arginase uh, 1, which can turn arginine and shunt it away from being uh, appropriately used. There are randomized control trials supporting this by Drover, Oslin, and Mara Mathieu. Uh, Drover uh, is an actual major elective surgery and is the largest meta-analysis of randomized control trials on enteral arginine supplementation. And in uh, 26 out of 35 of these uh, studies that were utilized for the formula, they all contain arginine, omega-3 and nucleotides. Going through those studies just suggested, you can actually see that there's a reduction in the risk of infection and length of stay with post-op immune nutrition. On the uh, uh, right-hand side, you see Drover 2011 used post-op immune nutrition, 22% reduction. Uh, in 2012, we see a reduction of 32%. And then and, uh, again in 2014, about 39%. These all equated to uh, roughly two, maybe two and a half days, uh, two and a quarter days probably, and you can see that uh, they were all statistically significant. Looking at 35 randomized control trials that Drover uh, studied in his meta-analysis, there was 25 of the 35 studies actually were all elective gastroenterology surgeries, and out of those 25 studies, 21 of the studies uh, looked at infectious complications and found that there was a reduction of 41%. And then there was a secondary outcome of a reduction of 2.3 days uh, for the hospital length of stay. Again, this is a, a fantastic meta-analysis that we have that these immunonutrients actually uh, work in the post-op period. Here you can see that in the 21 studies of the immunonutrition uh, containing arginine, omega-3, and uh, nucleotides, there was a 51% reduction in risk uh, infection complications uh, as that uh, red arrow points to it. And then other immunonutrients that only contained arginine, there was still a reduction, but not as significant. So there's got to be something to the formula of uh, arginine, omega-3 fatty acids, and nucleotides. Going to the guidelines about uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, this is, you know, my patient population. We have uh, our surgical ICU subserves 
all of my trauma patients, all of my surgical patients that are surgical uh, sepsis, as well as uh, we have some TBIs. Most of our TBIs will go to our neuro ICU if there's bed availability, but we have a very robust uh, elective neurosurgical um, group here. And oftentimes the TBI patients still come to my ICU. And looking at the guidelines, we see that immunomodulating formulas contain arginine and fish oil are suggested for severe trauma uh, patients. And based on our expert consensus, arginine with other agents, including EPA, DHA, glutamine, as you can see, are suggested in patients with TBI. And this is largely related to the effect of omega-3 fatty acids in accelerating the recovery of TBI patients. Again, going into surgery and trauma, uh, these immunomodulatory formulas can actually decrease sepsis. Uh, 30 in randomized control trials, uh, 22 in surgery, six in trauma, five in burn, four in critical illness, and one in sepsis. And you can see the force plot uh, on the side here that shows overall it's a positive impact with this immunomodulatory formula. 43% decrease in risk of infection and complication, Eight randomized control trials in surgery and trauma looked at risk of sepsis with a 52% reduction. This is strong evidence that supports that our immunomodulatory formulas are helpful. So you, what about use of peptides? Uh, evidence uh, for that, or at least the guidelines for that, uh, E4B, we suggest considering use of small peptide formulation patients with persistent diarrhea. And this is kind of the code brown incidence, right? Uh, incidence of diarrhea and critical illness uh, if there's anything that we can do to decrease the amount of diarrhea that we have in our ICU patient population, uh, the nurses will line up and hug you. You know, we've tried uh, various things. Recently, uh, we've tried a, uh, a lipid hydrolase that plugs into enteral uh, formulas. Seems to be helpful in decreasing diarrhea, but at the same time, our nurses are looking every day for uh, ways to decrease the amount of uh, linens that they're having to clean. Uh, the methods was a consecutive three-month period of retrospective chart review. They looked at Formula A, which is a more hydrolyzed, uh, higher MCT formula, 52 patients. And then Formula B was less hydrolyzed, more MCT formula, uh, lower MCT formula in 61 patients. The actual results, there was no statistical difference, number of C. diff tests, uh, and the number of antibiotics or laxatives uh, that were received. But here you can actually see on the next slide, that the Formula A with the more hydrolyzed um, uh, product had days of diarrhea down to 1.4 as opposed to four days. And then need for rectal tubes or the FMS, the tubes that go uh, inserted into the rectum was significantly reduced at 12% uh, percent compared to Formula B, which was 30%. Just a, a thought, food for thought to decrease the amount of diarrhea in patients. You know, these FMSs that we put in patients the fecal management systems aren't benign. Uh, if you've ever taken care of a patient that is sick and has had an FMS in for several days, a week, two weeks, and they end up getting a rectal ulceration, those bleed uh, very profusely because of the hemorrhoidal arcades that are down there, and it becomes very problematic. And so anytime we are on rounds, we're looking to get tubes out of people, the FMS is one of them. And if we can decrease the amount of diarrhea by simply switching, uh, switching to more hydrolyzed formula, it, w it may be beneficial. So what about uh, immunonutrition use in sepsis? This is probably the biggest controversy that's out there. And in the 2016 guidelines, uh, there was a recommendation that suggested that these immunonutrients uh, should not be used routinely in patients with sepsis, the rationale being that they contain arginine. And as we showed earlier, the arginine can shunt down the nitric oxide uh, pathway and cause vasodilatation. I would like to say at this point uh, that you know it's a it's a it's good in theory. It's a concept that is uh, certainly something to pay attention to. But whether or not it actually happens is largely debated. It certainly is a nice controversy to discuss. Uh, but I have not seen any uh, randomized control trials to date that looked at arginine solely arginine and uh, suggested that arginine repletion, arginine supplementation, arginine use in sepsis will either convert a patient uh, with stable sepsis to septic shock or worsen septic shock patients to uh, increase pressure requirements and decrease clinical outcomes. But here's the pathway, and we're going to go into some of the controversies uh, associated with this. Large portion of 
the data that we look at comes from this meta-analysis uh, that Dr. Darren Hyland did. He used a meta-analysis and it was a subgroup from the meta-analysis, the larger meta-analysis that he looked at, uh, containing predominantly of MICU patients with sepsis and it showed higher mortality in those receiving arginine-containing formulas. It was statistically based on three randomized control studies and their rankings. And so uh, these are the three different studies Dent et al. Uh, is an unpublished study. It still went into the meta-analysis. It was a low arginine formula of 5.5 versus placebo. There was randomization error with uh, more patients in the study group with pre-existing pneumonia. They were sicker patients that had pneumonia. And they were given, this study was given a very high quality score, meaning that it was ranked highly. And that's where the statistical difference comes uh, when you look at uh, Dr. Halen's work. Bertolonia et al. Uh, chose another low arginine formula, 6.5 grams per liter versus parental nutrition. Bertoloni's study actually is a small uh, subgroup uh, analysis of a larger multicenter study that was looking at enteral nutrition versus parental nutrition in non-septic patients. So they pulled all this data out and wanted to look at a subgroup analysis, only 36 patients uh, and most were admitted with pre-existing pneumonia again and showed higher mortality. These, these two first studies got high uh, quality scores and somehow drove the statistical significance that suggested that there was a higher mortality using arginine. If you actually read the uh, study when he does another subgroup analysis using an a priori hypothesis, he suggested that patients that received higher arginine formulas had a trend uh, to toward lower mortality, though that was not statistically significant. And then the Galvin study, which actually used a higher arginine formula versus high protein, had 181 patients. It was actually a, a true randomized control trial looking at uh, higher arginine formulas, showed that uh, the treatment group had lower mortality and somehow this got a lower quality score. So I'm gonna ask, uh, and we can certainly uh, address this in our questions today, but how is it that there's a large arginine controversy in sepsis when you're looking at two studies, one is not published, one had a randomized control, I mean a randomization error, and another uh, patient population was a subgroup analysis only containing 36 patients when the actual true randomized study was 81 patients using a higher arginine formula. I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out myself. So why I actually use uh, arginine immunonutrition in sepsis, again, this isn't you know, full on septic shock on multiple pressors because in my practice, we actually slow down to a trickle any kind of enteral nutrition when we're going on dual pressors or having to go over certain thresholds using our pressors. This is more out of fear for non-occlusive bowel ischemia uh, than anything. And truthfully, when you have patients that are going on multiple, multiple pressors, to maintain and augment the mean arterial pressure or maintain systolic blood pressure typically means that you don't have source control with your sepsis or they're in the throes of some sort of deteriorating clinical decline. And so oftentimes, uh, one of the bigger questions should be, are these patients gonna actually be able to utilize enteral nutrition if they're truly inflamed? And so in my practice, what we do is if a patient is septic, they're on antibiotics, but they're stable, they're doing okay, they're not on pressors. We don't have uh, concerns that they're gonna uh, deteriorate. We're gonna still use enteral route. And when we do our enteral route, we're still gonna use uh, immunonutrition. And we look at a sub-analysis, uh, when you look at this uh, Highland study, and you look at the uh, sub-analysis, these uh, subgroup or sub-analyses oftentimes are considered by most experts to be uh, hypothesis drivers. They shouldn't be uh, taken at clinical practice. They shouldn't be guiding our clinical practice. They should be uh, food for thought. They should be fodder for driving a true randomized study. They should be something that we would consider uh, in the back of our heads, acknowledge that, yeah, this could exist, but then why is that and how are we going to get a study up and running looking at uh, arginine and decreasing uh, the concern over this controversy? Now, I could also, on the flip side, uh, sit here and say, uh, once the study is published, is there an actual decline? And I still don't think that, and I have a study that will actually show you that. Highlands meta-analysis secondarily also has significant flaws, uh, some of which we just discussed. And so uh, there's multiple new studies that have been coming out showing us use of arginine in septic patients 
actually might not actually cause the harm. And we actually uh, published a, an open access uh, journal looking at arginine critical illness and why we might actually think arginine would be beneficial. Here's one of those studies that I was talking about. This is a study that was done solely to be a pilot uh, program, or rather a pilot study. Uh, Yvette Luking uh, infused, not, not enterally, and I get it, it's not enterally, but when you're dealing with a patient who is septic uh, and you're gonna give them enteral nutrition, I guess the biggest question would be, are they gonna truly absorb uh, those nutrients? And if so, at what concentration? Uh, is it going to actually affect any uh, meaningful uh, hemodynamics? Uh, and so she wanted to go straight for uh, the big shot and just put it into the central venous line. And she infused eight septic shock patients uh, with uh, sequential doses of arginine. As you can see there, uh, they, they infused these over uh, three doses and whole body, ar whole body arginine Nitric oxide and protein uh, metabolism were measured using stable isotope techniques. This is one of the, the cool isotope studies. And baseline values were compared with healthy controls, hemodynamics, and records. Plasma arginine actually increased. I mean, that makes sense. You're putting it into the, uh, the central venous system as opposed to uh, hypothesizing that it's going to get uh, taken up from the uh, gut and at what concentration. So we actually showed that it went up. And this coincided with increased de novo arginine as well as increased nitric oxide production. Now, this is where people are going to be like, well, see, nitric oxide was produced. But it also showed in this study that the mean arterial and pulmonary pressure as well as the gastric mucosal arterial pressure of carbon dioxide had no difference. There was no change. So mean arterial pressure, the one that we actually use to guide our uh, sepsis, because most people titrate uh, their pressors for mean arterial pressure over 65, pulmonary uh, pressure in the pulmonary circuiture didn't decrease, and the gastric mucosal arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide didn't decrease, which uh, is a surrogate marker for uh, bowel ischemia. Uh, didn't, nothing changed, not one thing Kate's, but stroke volume increased and lactic acid decreased. So somehow uh, the arginine improved stroke volume. And so when you look at stroke volume, uh, there's only, two things that go into changing stroke volume, and that's heart rate and mean arterial pressure. And so if you're changing your stroke volume, that means you're increasing stroke volume, which is a good thing when you have a septic patient. So what about the future? Uh, chronic critical illness, and then certainly my, uh, my persistent inflammation, immune uh, suppression, catabolic syndrome, so the PIC syndrome. Here we actually uh, published uh, this diagram. And so if you could see uh, in the yellow, right in the uh, kind of top left corner, there's sepsis. This again could be anything. This could be a major burn over 35%, necrotizing pancreatitis, polytrauma. But uh, what we have found that when the uh, human body gets severely stressed, uh, you have a pro-inflammatory and an anti-inflammatory response. You have this innate immunity and an adaptive immunity response. Uh, back when uh, Bone described the CARS response, uh, the compensatory mechanism. We initially thought that it might actually be a true compensatory mechanism, that SIRS happened uh, and then CARS would come by and restore homeostasis. But we now know that the evolution of these maladaptive uh, responses happens simultaneously. You have a robust systemic inflammation response and you have this maladaptive CARS response. And if this is sustained greater than 14 days uh, in the ICU, in our definition of chronic critical illness, this makes you vulnerable to developing PICs. About 5% of the population goes on to uh, have this early multi-organ failure, fulminant death trajectory. And that's largely based off of probably genetics or something that they came in with. It's either going to be uh, advanced age and comorbidities with some sort of maladaptive surge response, puts them into this irrecoverable spiral and they die. But luckily that's only 5%. Only 40% of patients uh, go on to develop chronic critical illness. And of those 40% of patients that develop chronic critical illness, about 60% will go on to develop PICS. So why is this actually important? Why do we care about this? So five to 7% of all patients admitted to the ICU develop chronic critical illness. This is all comers across the nation. In our ICU uh, patient population, this is data that came from the University of Florida, trauma patients 
Uh, certainly polytrauma patients with an ISS greater than uh, 10 to 15 will end up having uh, CCI 20% of the time. Traumatic brain injuries were actually excluded from this uh, patient uh, population analysis, so it's a true 20%. And after sepsis, 50% uh, of patients go on to develop chronic critical illness. More than 380,000 cases uh, with 107,000 in-hospital deaths annually. Patients that develop chronic critical illness devour 30% of ICU utilization, and certainly it comes down to a cost effectiveness. 26 billion in healthcare expenses. We got to do something about this at this point. We published a uh, study uh, looking at our protocol, our nutrition protocol in the ICU. It's evidence-based. Um, I like it. It's a good uh, protocol. But we we follow standard care. We follow Aspen SCCM guidelines, and we uh, generally try and do enteral nutrition up front. Uh, we do do the immunonutrition, and right after about a week, we transition to uh, a more standard formula. But our immunonutrition does contain arginine, uh, fatty acids, and uh, nucleotides. But what we studied is the chronic critical illness group greater than 14 days and the rapid recovery. So if you see RAP on the next slide, that's the rapid recovery folks or the folks that actually got out of the hospital before day, I mean, out of the ICU, excuse me, before day 14. So we looked at 56 patients that had chronic critical illness and I double matched them to the rapid recovery patients just to increase the, uh, the power of the study. And we uh, matched them for Charleston comorbidity index, age, sex, and SOFA score. The chronic critical illness uh, folks received 75% of their goal calories uh, for one uh, for that one month uh, study period, and 88% uh, uh, if you exclude the first week. And so I actually put that in there because you got to remember, as a as a surgeon, a trauma surgeon, uh, when these patients come in with multiple gunshot wounds or they have bowel perforation after an MVC, uh, they get kicked in the uh, stomach and get a uh, perforated stomach uh, after. Uh, a horse injury, uh, they get shot, or they're coming in with, you know, hinchy three, hinchy four diverticulitis and require uh, emergent surgery for uh, an emergent colectomy. They have duodenal ulcer perforations with large amount of succus and contamination. These patients go for damage control operation. And at that point, we're looking more for source control and stopping bleeding. And so they require multiple different operations to restore bowel continuity and get the abdominal wall closed. And this is all happening generally within the first three to four, maybe even five days for the multiple take back operations. And so you can see how very quickly if um, if you're going back and forth, you may or may not be on pressors for uh, sepsis. Uh, the caloric deficit uh, increases within that first week. But once you exclude it, we're actually feeding these patients in weeks two, three and four pretty well. The national average uh, for reaching goal calories in major academic institutions is right around 50, 60 percent. And so I think, you know, we're doing a reasonable job. And, you know, there's a whole different body of literature looking at permissive underfeeding, hypochloric feeds, trophic feeds, uh, autophagy. There's a whole evolving body of literature suggesting that, you know, if we're not at goal calories within the first two days, of a septic patient or a polytrauma patient, it might might really not matter or have that high of an impact. But certainly after two and three, four days, uh, four weeks, we're getting up to goal. So the results, uh, the chronic critical illness patients were largely discharged from our ICUs to non-home destinations, 81% of the time versus a third in the rapid recovery. And these non-home destinations are not your rehabs. The non-home destinations for this was largely a long-term acute care facility, hospice, or the morgue. And so these uh, unfortunately, unfortunate patient population don't ever really go home. And when they go to these long-term acute care facilities and they are in this spiral of chronic critical illness or persistent inflammation, immunosuppression, catabolic syndrome, it's hard to break it. And when it's hard to break it, they end up getting sepsis recidivism. And oftentimes they come back to us uh, from these LTACs only with worsening sepsis. And we actually identified that is uh, sometimes not the same infection that they're coming back with. Uh, a lot of people are concerned that, you know, when you go to an LTAC, you just come right back with the same infection. But most of these patients are getting discharged after recovery of their sepsis insult, only come back with a new onset uh, nosocomial infection. 12 months survival drastically has decreased uh, to two thirds versus 92%. And then we looked at biomarkers for this PICS uh, syndrome in our CCI group. So when we looked at CCI, 
Uh, they all remain persistently uh, inflamed, looking at IL-6 and IL-8. IL-6 is a great inflammatory biomarker. It largely traces CRP. So if you don't have IL-6 at your hospital, you can use CRP. Uh, but what ends up happening is they remain persistently inflamed out to a month. They are more immunosuppressed in the uh, critical, uh, chronic critical ill patients. Looking at absolute lymphocyte count, you see that there's a statistical significant the uh, further out we go, and there's a trend throughout that, that the uh, CCI folks uh, have lower lymphocyte counts. And then we looked at soluble uh, program death ligand 1, which is SPDL1, and that's a marker of immunosuppression. And again, that was statistically significant. What about uh, catabolism and stress metabolism? Glucagon-like peptide is a great biomarker for stress metabolism. It uh, increases insulin resistance. And when you look at uh, stress metabolism, uh, CCI patients are very much uh, resistant. And then when you look at catabolism, we looked at urinary 3-methylhistidine levels. And the urinary 3-methylhistidine levels uh, correlates with protein breakdown. And so if you're breaking down your endogenous lean muscle mass, you end up secreting 3-methylhistidine in uh, your urine. And we can use that as a biomarker. And you can see that though it wasn't statistically significant, there was a trend that chronic critical illness remain uh, much higher than the rapid recovery folks up to about uh, three weeks. Now, this is uh, Dr. Efron, one of my partners, um, and uh, the interesting stuff that he is looking at, he's looking at both human and animal models, and he's looking at these myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Uh, and what he ended up publishing was that uh, in a group of severe sepsis, and septic shock patients, MDSCs are dramatically increased out to 28 days. When MDSCs from uh, these septic patients were co-cultured, co the MDSCs were placed in with T cells, T lymphocytes. Uh, the T cell proliferation and the Th1, Th2 cytokine production were largely suppressed. That was statistically significant. So essentially what he did was take some Petri dishes and he would take the MDCs, purified MDSCs, put them in with uh, regular T lymphocytes, and the proliferation of a T, uh, T cell response, as well as the cytokine production of a Th1, Th2 um, production were suppressed. Additionally, when he looked at uh, septic MDSCs, uh, had up to about a statistically significant upregulated ARG1 expression or arginase 1 expression. And so this arginase 1 expression drastically reduced the, uh, the amount of arginine circulating in the uh, system. Unfortunately, we did not actually measure arginine depletion, but you can imagine that if you have a profound arginase 1 uh, expression uh, and you have decrease in T cell production, we're starting to see that arginine uh, supplementation may be beneficial in even severe septic shock patients. Finally, in this uh, severe sepsis, septic shock patients, they also had increased nosocomial infections, prolonged ICU uh, stays, and poor functional status at discharge, and that was all statistically significant. What are MDSCs? They're secreted by the bone marrow in response to inflammation. Again, they secrete the arginase 1, and they also promote this pro-inflammatory state and consumes drastic amounts of energy. And so you could see that uh, in this CCI PICS patient population with revved up MDSCs, this may be the driving mechanism of cachexia and critical illness. This may be the, the underlying pathophysiology of why giving standard formula to these patients does not uh, make them uh, nu nutritionally replete. In fact, they're at high risk of malnutrition and they almost have this cachexia response. Despite all the nutrition that we gave them, they, they still remain persistently inflamed, persistently catabolic, and per uh, persistently uh, immunosuppressed. So one of my hypotheses uh, currently is here's a diagram, the top one you've already seen. Uh, you have the protein catabolism cachexia largely driven by the inflammation, but what about the immunosuppression? What about this adaptive uh, response? And if you look at the green line, that thin green line uh, that says MDSCs on it, you see that after a certain period of time, the MDSCs in co-culture will actually uh, elevate in the septic patient. These are individual cell responses that were traced out uh, in a multitude of patients. And so my hypothesis is what happens when you give arginine at this point in uh, time? Can we actually decrease the MDSC response? Can we push these myeloid-derived suppressor cells that are immature bone marrow uh, cells? Can we actually push them toward maturation to decrease the arginase 1 production 
or can we actually just overwhelm arginase one and replete arginine? That's a, a question that we're we're currently looking at. So uh, I guess stay tuned. How does uh, immune and nutrition fit in? So this is a little bit of a recap. Arginine certainly helps with T cell function, innate and adaptive immune response. It's uh, synergistic with leucine in the mammalian target of rapamycin, stimulates synthesis of nucleotides in vitro, and helps with wound healing, uh, certainly with proline, as it's a critical component of collagen. Omega-3 fatty acids, uh, I think the, the literature is now supporting uh, omega-3 fatty acids pretty strongly in uh, a multitude of patients, of which we discussed traumatic brain injury. I would say anybody that is at risk of being inflamed uh, should be receiving omega-3 fatty acids at this point. Uh, we just uh, published in JPEN a current meta-analysis. It was an update of Lorenzo Podali's um, former study in 2012. Just came out this year, 2020. Uh, we looked at 49 randomized control trials looking at parenteral use of omega-3 fatty acids uh, and uh, showed that we have decreased sepsis events. Uh, we have decreased hospital length of stay, decreased ICU length of stay. Pretty good data there. Uh, nucleotides, critically ill, uh, important, especially for purine and primitive bases for these rapidly dividing cells. So in conclusion, uh, enteral immune nutrition with arginine, omega-3 fatty acids, and nucleotides is indicated. Uh, recent data suggests no risk to supplementing L-arginine in septic patients. Uh, there are studies out there that are looking at pilot studies. And then immune nutrition for chronic critical illness and PICS is very supportive and helpful. Uh, at this point, I will take uh, any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenthal, uh, for an excellent and timely presentation. I am going to start with our first question. We've had a couple that have come in that are in relationship to your protocol, um, Dr. Rosenthal, and how you use immunonutrition during the first week and then um, switch to a standard diet, diet after that. And so the question would be um, in relationship to the work that you showed from your colleague, Dr. Efron, about the MDSCs and how they're elevated for 28 days out. Is there a rationale to use arginine containing immunonutrition for longer than the first week of the ICU stay? Certainly uh, uh, would think so. Uh, our protocol currently is a little bit driven by cost. A uh, little bit from the data, most of the ERAS protocols uh, all said that you should use it for a week uh, pre-op and then uh, post-op up to 10 days. So we're looking around that seven to 10 day period to start switching patients to more of a standard formula. But if we do have a chronic critical ill patient, certainly a PICS patient, it does make good sense to keep supplementing with immunonutrition. Uh, we do use immunonutrition patients that do have poor wound healing. So patients that are there for a, a while, we start mm -hmm. supplementing uh, more of our, our other protein sources. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next uh, question is in relationship to the work that you showed from Yvette Luking. And um, the question is, in that study, the arginine was uh, administered in an IV form. Is there, um, are, do you have any concerns about you know, extrapolating the lack of hemodynamic effect if you're comparing IV arginine with enteral arginine? Uh, I would say no, it should actually go the other way around. If okay. you had somebody who gave enteral nutrition, enteral arginine, and there was no effect on uh, mean arterial pressure, the biggest question would be, well, did they actually absorb the, uh, the arginine to begin with to ever have any kind of effect on the mean arterial pressure? But by circumventing uh, the absorptive capacity and just putting it into the central venous system, uh, and they actually demonstrated that they enhanced the arginine concentration in plasma, there was still no change in mean arterial pressure, pulmonary pressure, or that gastric um, uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, next question. Is it safe to use L-arginine in a critically ill patient who also has cancer? I guess I'll answer that question with a question. I, I'm trying to figure out what their concern would be. My, I would say no. I mean, we use immunonutrition in cancer uh, cancer patients, so I would say yes. But if if I, I think there's probably a little bit more of a specific question uh, behind that. Okay. Well, I'll keep watching the questions pane, and if we get something more specific, I will come back to it. Um, I will, next, hey, Mary, oh, go ahead. I, yes. I will say one thing. So uh, if you look at 
uh, Efron's work, uh, his biggest mentor was a guy named Link Moldauer. And Link mm -hmm. Moldauer and Efron, uh, along with uh, one of the residents on the T32 grant, uh, looked at cancer cachexia uh, with several other uh, institutions. And cancer cachexia is actually uh, largely driven by MDSCs. And what they ended up doing was saying, well, if that's actually causing or at least tied into the multifactorial purpose of uh, cachexia, um, they uh, isolated it in septic patients. And that's where their hypothesis for the study came from that I presented. So mm -hmm. if we're saying that we can supplement it in septic patients uh, with MDSCs that are proliferating, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to give it to a cancer patient. Okay, thank you for that. Let's see, our next question um, is about omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it says omega-3 fatty acids have been misproved to increase bleeding in cardiac surgery. Um, should it be standard to provide them to all surgery patients, including those receiving TPN prior to surgery? Yes, I think that's actually been disproved at this point. And um, I was recently on a different format with a with Met Berger, and mm -hmm. she supplements them all to her cardiothoracic vascular patients. And I think she's coming out with a study. Uh, I, I can't promise this. I think uh, that she's going to show that there's no increased risk of bleeding in any of these patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Here's a follow-up to the question about arginine and cancer. I was under the impression that L-arginine promoted cancer growth. Hmm. And I think there's pro it's probably, to my knowledge, it's an area of ongoing study because of the great variability in different kinds of cancer. But the work that you mentioned, um, Dr. Rosenthal from Luke Moldauer, and um, looking at the cachexia and the proliferation of MDSCs, I understood that that is associated um, most frequently with solid tumors. Yes. Uh, okay, and so I think maybe thinking about it in terms of solid tumors as separate from other types of cancer might be one way of kind of finding our way. You know, I would also be cautious in saying any one thing promotes tumor growth. At the end of the day, uh, there's a lot of hypotheses out there. There are some good studies, uh, but, you know, to say that one uh, amino acid promotes tumor growth, uh, I'd be pretty skeptical of that. Unfortunately, I'm uh, just a, a, a dumb trauma surgeon, as they say. I'm not a, I'm not that sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, cancer doctor yet. But uh, I'll have to review the literature, and I can get back to you guys. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. All right. Let's see. Got a couple more questions coming in. Do you have experience, um, Dr. Rosenthal, in using small bowel feeding tubes when feeding your patients in your your surgical trauma ICU? Absolutely. We, uh, so we do G tubes, we do J tubes, we do GJ tubes. Uh, we do dop off tubes and feed the um, uh, post pyloric area. So we, we have a lot in feeding tubes in our, in our ICU. Okay, awesome. We're getting quite a few questions here about immunosuppressed patients. And um, an example would be someone who's uh, post transplant. And uh, I don't know if you are taking care of that type of patient from that standpoint. Is that something you could speak to or is another specialty? No, I mean, uh, it should be safe. Uh, you know, omega-3 fatty acids in transplant patients is already being used. Uh, I don't think there's a study specifically looking at uh, nucleotide use in transplant patients. But again, arginine is a conditional amino acid, so they still need it. Uh, so is there a specific time period that they're questioning? Is it like within the first week of a transplant? But they they should still be able to utilize arginine. Okay. Yeah, there was one question that it was um, a new organ transplant patient. Yeah, I would say once they're hemodynamically stable, uh, they can start uh, animal nutrition for sure. Okay, thank you. Let's see, the questions are keeping coming in. How long would you recommend immunonutrition for? For example, until discharged, one month, two months. Um, I'm sure that is quite dependent on the type of patient. Uh, certainly for the first week before an elective operation. I think the strongest signal is seven to 10 days post-op. 
but you know if you can do it your hospital system's not worried about cost i would say keep going with it you know there's nothing that says that even in the post surgical phase uh, they can't take shakes that have immune nutrition in them. I myself, I take uh, uh, fish oil and a probiotic every day. So I think mm -hmm. if if I'm doing that as a you know normal person, not about to have a surgery, I, dear God, I hope I'm not about to have a surgery. But uh, I would say that these are supplements that we can use in daily life, even after discharge. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, a pediatric question. Is it okay to uh -oh. use immunonutrition in pediatrics? What age is appropriate? I, I, I don't know that answer, sorry. I can just contribute that um, there are a couple of studies, but it's in less than 10 patients. And, you know, they basically looked at feasibility and not outcomes. And so the data is just, it is very sparse in that area. Let's see, um, you mentioned, um, Dr. Rosenthal, that if you have someone who's in septic shock and on dual pressors, that you would slow their feeds down to a trickle. Can you kind of describe their course in the best case of how you would essentially help as they become stable, how would your feeding practice change? Kind of like, how would so you ramp up? Um, so I can tell you from a practice standpoint, if they're on stable pressors or de-escalating pressors, those are kind of when we start looking at ramping up. Our current protocol is a little bit lagging um, and we're working on it, but our protocol says that over a certain threshold of any one presser or dual pressors, we need to start decreasing to a trickle feed. Uh, we recently, during our protocol meetings, took off paralytics as a reason to stop uh, enteral nutrition, it took me a little bit of time, but uh, there's, there's with pressors, there's a large unknown. Uh, Dr. Jay Patel uh, actually has a lot of data on this. He's done several reviews and he's actually got his patient, his own patient population, and he's feeding these patients enterally on high dose uh, pressors and he's having uh, no, no poor outcomes to my knowledge at this point. And he's uh, published interim analyses on this so I would uh, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully he'll come out with his uh, study uh, anytime soon. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much again for the wonderful presentation, taking all these questions. So on behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope you found this information useful to your practice. We want to wish you a very good rest of the day and uh, to please stay safe and healthy. Thank you.